The ocean is a vast universe of light and darkness. In its mystery, there are many creatures we know and love. Whales, dolphins, seals, and so on. But like so many famous creatures here on land, there behind the scenes is a plethora of staff that hold the whole production together. Today we are going to learn about one of those lesser appreciated staff members, the tiny but important Capelin. Victoria Neville is the Senior Specialist of Marine Ecosystems and Fisheries at World Wildlife Fund. She is my friend and the voice of the Capelin. Please enjoy this conversation. Alrighty, we're going. So I'm here. I'll do like a little introduction yeah. or something before. That's cool. Um, that I'll just edit in. But mm -hmm. uh, we're here to talk about Capelin. So thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, Jordan. <laughs> I think a, a good spot to start would be, oh, we also have a lovely little guest here, Juniper. <laughs> Vic's uh, new puppy, new little puppy. She's <laughs> gnawing on my hand. <laughs> um, it's hard as a new parent, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and she's so cute too, and you just want to let her do everything. <laughs> um, oh, a good place to start would be uh, what is a capelin? Okay, what so, are capelin? <laughs> so a capelin or capelin are a small-ish fish um, that are known as a forage fish. So they're a fish that are, um, they're related to like smelts, um, and uh, they're a food, so a food source for a lot of the larger fish and seabirds and other creatures in the province. Um, they're known as uh, a keystone forage fish or a linchpin species because um, they feed primarily on capelin, or sorry, on uh, plankton. They are capelin. And so um, if, you're, if you've ever looked at a food web, say in school, um, basically how it works in the marine ecosystem is uh, the primary producers are the phytoplankton, so the plant plankton. Uh, they're eaten by the zooplankton, so the animal plankton. And uh, <clears throat> a species that is specialized to feed on the animal plankton are capelin. And so they have this critical role in the ecosystem of converting all of that energy that's contained in the plankton and making it accessible to uh, cod, salmon, seabirds, whales. Um, and that's why they're referred to as the linchpin or the keystone species. Like the other day when you were um, like briefly describing sort of like the layers of the ocean. Yep. Um, you're putting, was it plankton first and then like zooplankton? Yep. Is it, is it zoo or zoo? Zoo. Zoo, zoo, zoo plankton. Yep. And then it's capelin? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> at that, so you've probably heard um, herbivores and carnivores being used like in Jurassic Park or something like that. Um, so that term can be even more specific in um, when you get into ecology. Um, so uh, it, Fish, uh, if you've ever heard the term like Pisces for fish, like the zodiac. So fish that eat other fish are called piscivores. And fish that eat plankton are called planktivores. Um, so there are a number of different fish that are planktivores in the Newfoundland shelf ecosystem. But capelin are by far the most abundant and the most important out of all of those planktivores. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like they're like a stepping stone for other fish in the ocean because they get so many nutrients and then they become a food source for everything below them. Yeah. So basically, um, if you were to remove these creatures from the ecosystem, you have this disconnect where you've got production in the ecosystem from energy and nutrients and sunlight going through and being contained in the plankton, but no way for the larger troph or the higher trophic levels or the, um, the higher consumers on the food web uh, to actually be able to eat that. And so without Capelin, you would have lots of starvation in the ecosystem. <laughs> oh, she just got trapped. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We can re-record that. No, that's all right. <laughs> it's super cute. I thought she was going to be less distracted. That's all right. The little pup just got caught behind a little coffee table. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, they're just a, a really 
important and dominant species in Newfoundland. Yeah. Are mm-hmm. they um, are they found all over the world, or is it just in colder waters, or like where where are they located? Yeah, so this kind of a role of forage fish is going to be found in all of uh, the oceans of the world. But capelin are, yeah, they're more of like Newfoundland, um, like Greenland, the Arctic, um, you know, over to the uh, other side oh. of the Atlantic. Um, so they kind of feel that fill that niche in the Northwest Atlantic. Okay. Whereas like anchovies or something like that, or sandlands uh, okay. might fill it at a different and a different ocean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or a different part of the Atlantic. Okay. So recently there's like in the media a little bit here in Newfoundland, there's been like the big scare about the capelin not showing up or like the, the capelin stock being down. Mm-hmm. Um, do researchers and people such as yourself know why that is or what are some of the, the theories behind that? I guess um, the science on capelin is being really ramped up right now due to political pressures um, and social pressures. Um, But to answer that question, you really need to look back to the early 90s. Um, Capelin are a species that can change in their abundance really quickly. They're a boom-bust species. So because they feed on plankton, um, if the conditions are right, i.e. nutrients, sunlight, ice conditions are right, um, they can explode in population numbers, or if the conditions are poor, um, they can do really poorly in a year, and that can change quickly. I guess what um, is really troubling in Newfoundland is that in the 1990s, they kind of dipped off and then never really had a boom again um, until quite recently where they had a few smaller you know, increases in abundance, but really not back to that um, those levels that we saw prior to the 1990s. And that has been linked um, with the collapse of cod and other ground fish. So we really believe that we need capelin um, he- at healthy levels uh, for the recovery of other species that aren't doing well. I might be, I might be like misunderstanding it a little no. bit because wouldn't, like as soon as I thought, okay, like the early '90s, they had the moratorium on cod, yep. because the that cod stock was depleted. Mm-hmm. To me, that makes me think that the capelin stock would rise because there's no predator. Yeah. So uh, that uh, what you're thinking about is actually what we thought in the 1990s. That was a term that um, that was a a major paper that came out in the '90s called uh, "Trophic Cascades in a Cod Dominated Ecosystem." Um, so we thought that the removal of that predator uh, would result in increases in the things that it would eat. And uh, so we saw increases in shrimp and crab and other things that cod also eat. But the piece of the pie, I guess, that um, is now a little bit more clear is the link to climate. And so what was happening in the early 90s was not only was there um, over-exploitation for the cod stocks, but the conditions had actually changed really quickly from like warmer conditions to a colder conditions. And uh, so essentially the conditions that were favorable for projection of capelin were gone. So we actually think that part of the reason that cod collapse was a lack of this food availability. So it's not, it wasn't the entire reason that cod collapsed, but it's part of the reason and it may be part of the reason why they never fully recovered. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what kind of um, climate is optimal for, uh, for like, Caitlin to be? Yeah, so um, that's really complicated, and we're still um, – researchers at uh, DFO and at the universities are still trying to figure that out exactly. Um, but it seems that uh, cooler conditions um, in the 90s were sort of responsible for this, uh, this poor um, – product production of cod and i think i think the warmer conditions that we've been seeing more recently um were more favorable to capelin and cod so warmer conditions more favorable to capelin and cod um cooler conditions more favorable to say shrimp and crab yeah Mm -hmm. my first memory of capelin is being like probably 12 Mm -hmm. and we went to the beach and all these little tiny fish were on the beach coming in, rolling, as they call it here. 
and uh, we went down there with like little nets and buckets and mm-hmm. stuff. And we're just grabbing them. And I had no idea. I wasn't going to eat a fish when I was like 12. It was like crazy and fun and yeah. weird, right? Um, but yeah, that's a phenomenon here in Newfoundland where the all these little capelin roll up on the beach. Like, can you talk a lot like yeah. about that and how that works? Okay, cool. And what they're doing. <laughs> um, so it's really interesting because uh, this is one of the only places in the world where capelin actually do this thing. They spawn on the beach. They actually get out of the water and get onto the beach to spawn. And um, they don't do that everywhere else. And researchers at Memorial and at um, University of Manitoba and at DFO have been trying to figure out why um, why that is. And there's they're kind of narrowing in on that now. And they think that um, the waters are kind of a little bit too cold um, for those eggs and larvae to rear quickly. So when they spawn on the beach... Um, in the right on the right kind of conditions, uh, they their eggs and larvae are actually um, able to develop faster in warmer conditions and uh, have less predation by other creatures. Um, so that's part of the reason why in Newfoundland they choose beaches um, because when conditions are optimal. And so what's happening, which is pretty cool, is that the um, males and females uh, at about age two three, four, um, five are coming, uh, to the beaches, uh, ready to spawn. And, uh, they basically all die at that time. So, um, females are there to deposit eggs. Males are there to fertilize them and they get down on the beach. Um, they come up to the beach at the high tide and, uh, the males are actually able to sort of uh, they've got a specialized shape. Nope, not your wine. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. They've got a special shape, and they can actually sort of pin down um, the females um, in order to make sure that their eggs are being fertilized. And then, uh, essentially, they've contributed all of their energy into producing the eggs and sperm, and so they almost all of them die at that time. Okay. Mm-hmm. So is that a new technique that they developed to overcome the the climate situation or is that like something they've always done well um some fish just do that um (laughs) you know uh like pacific salmon uh, a lot of species of pacific salmon do that Uh, it's just one of many reproductive strategies right like some fish will you know reproduce multiple times throughout their life um i guess capelin are just maybe it's just conjecture here but maybe it's just the nature of that boom bust cycle that um you know they got a couple of good years they grow they contribute all of their energy into um reproduction and they just one bang and that's it yeah mm-hmm. yep. and this is primarily like on sandy beaches right it doesn't happen on rocky shores yeah so um there was a researcher um here in newfoundland who went out and looked at um where capelin were spawning and took samples of the sand and um he found like it's not sand exactly it's like that gravelier like a little bit almost quite a little bit but somewhere between sand and pebble yeah like a really um large grain of sand or a fine grain of pebble seems to be the right conditions for the it seems like that's almost the the perfect texture for holding the eggs up yeah, like, that's that's what I think it is. So like when I go out to the beaches and do sampling, I like push a little like a, a core into the sand and uh, I'll find that um, uh, they're, the eggs are distributed really, really deep into the beach. Okay. So um, yeah, so it's a it's really good. It's a really good incubator, I think, for the yeah. eggs. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Are there parts of Newfoundland where they... Um well, I mean, like, the beaches vary so greatly, like, all around the island. Yeah. Um, are they continuously all the way around the island, or is it just, like, one... Is it just the Avalon, or is it the Southern Shore, or, like... Well, I would answer this question, question differently last year. Like, the northeast coast of Newfoundland is where a lot of this spawning has occurred for the last 10 years or so. Um... 
But um, this year, uh, we've been seeing spawning on the West Coast, on the South Coast, and even in PEI, which is sort of unprecedented. Oh, so, wow. so those types of conditions or those types of beaches um, are, are across the island. They're, they're all across the island. But I guess um, it's about whether strategically it's the best way for the Cape Linda to go. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, it's more beneficial for them to spawn offshore and not use the beaches at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Where, like, how would they be spawning offshore? Well, they basically, um, they do do that. Uh, they do that um, in the same type of gravel that you see on the beaches. It does exist in the offshore as well. Um, and so basically, uh, if the weather is cold, like if it was cold on the beaches, like really cold, um, they wouldn't, it, there would be no purpose to spawn on the beaches. So if it's like below two degrees, they're not going to spawn on the beach. And if it's above 12 degrees, they're not going to spawn on the beach because um, 12 degrees and above, I think they'll basically get burnt. Like the sun energy, like the, oh, really? the energy is too high. The eggs will get burnt. The eggs will essentially, what the term we use is like desiccated. They'll get dried out. Um, so in those cases, Capelin would, I'm using air quotations, choose to spawn in the water instead where they're not at risk to exposure. Um, but then it's going to take them longer to develop. And so they're at risk in other ways. How would they even know like the air temperature, you know? <laughs> I, I know it's like, it, <laughs> and they'd be like, no, nah, this year we're doing it in the water boys. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there's a whole lot of cues like chemical cues okay. in the ocean. Um, so like you, sometimes you think about the ocean as just being like this soup, but there's like all kinds of processes that occur in the ocean that Capelin are going to be able to pick up on that are dependent on temperature. Okay, yeah, I guess the water to it, like near the surface, would be. Yeah, it could be that. It could be the timing of the phytoplankton. Like, essentially, their the timing of their spawning has to do with um, making sure that their larvae are emerging at the right time that they they have plankton to feed on yeah. at that time. So, it's probably a whole suite of chemical cues that they're picking up on. But I don't know why Cape Lunar are so smart. Yeah, it's weird, eh? Mm-hmm. Because they're like just little dumb looking fish. I know. How long are they? Like six inches, maybe? Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. Even smaller. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, for people not familiar with like Newfoundland Capelin traditions, mm-hmm. it's like a common practice to just go and get them and like smoke them, yep. essentially, right? Because you can't debone them because they're so it's just not worth your time. No, it's true. And then you just eat the whole thing. And you either love it or hate it. <laughs> yeah, I am. Um, Do you eat them? Yeah, so I am not from Newfoundland. I was um, born in Cape Breton, and uh, Cape Lynn don't really spawn there. Oh, they do spawn, but they don't do it on the beaches. So it's not part of our culture. Um, so I went to the beach uh, to get Cape Lynn by myself without any other Newfoundlanders around. So I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and so uh, there's males and females, and the, the males are milty right like they're covered in s- sperm essentially and they're like a bit gross to me like that doesn't seem all that appetizing so i kind of picked out you know maybe six or seven uh gravid females so that's a female full of eggs i picked them up and i took them home and i just like battered them like i would a cod and like pan fried them and it was like really delicious because it was like eating like a sushi roll like it was like there was a little bit of meat in there but it was like mostly that roll yeah uh, and the eggs and it was delicious yeah so it was awesome i don't know if that's like a normal thing for newfoundlanders to do but it's what i did for sure i haven't done it in ages and i might be like completely wrong but i'm pretty sure they go for the males yeah because they don't want the row yeah right? yeah well um like um, I think Newfoundlanders eat them a bunch of different ways, depending on what community you lived in and whatever. But I'll, like, I think smoking them and drying them is popular. But the fishery, in the fishery, they actually do take females uh, for their eggs because of their market for the row in Japan. Okay. Yeah, but that's totally different than what people culturally do in Newfoundland. Yeah, it's so bizarre here, like um, the people's relationship with the sea, because. 
there it's been the the blood and like the life of Newfoundland. It's why Newfoundland is Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they don't eat seaweed. Mm -hmm. Or they don't like you know, there's so many things about the sea, certain creatures that they just won't even touch. Like I yeah. know, for example, like um sea urchin gets processed here. Mm -hmm. But like so many Newfoundlanders look at it as just like seagull food. <laughs> Isn't that so weird? Like and it's a delicacy other places, right? I think it's I think that's probably more of a Newfoundland thing than a Labrador thing because uh, I spent some time in Labrador and I found like in Labrador people are a lot more creative about um, the types of sea seafoods that they eat. Like I heard about people eating periwinkles off the beach, eating uh, they eat rock cod up there, which we don't even touch here. But I think that's not really um, all that surprising based on sort of the historical culture yeah. where Newfoundland primarily exported seafood right so yeah. um you know there's this whole idea of just like getting that food out to market and you know those merchants coming out to the outport and buying all of the seafood yeah. so you know i think that there might just be a little bit of that still in the culture of like um exporting seafood more than necessary like now there's lots of people who eat it but um the export is hugely part of the culture yeah so, um, for Capelin, is there a specific, well, I know it's in the summer, but is there like a specific month you could pin it down to where they start spawning or is it, Your does it vary? Your are so good, Jordo. That's oh, awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just went to a lecture, um, at the Geo Center the other day where this was discussed. Yeah. And, um, so they used to time, and I just learned this at the Geo Center from the research scientist at DFO, Hannah Murphy. Uh, so they used to actually... Cable sorry, sorry, what's a DFO? Sorry, it's a, it's Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Okay. Um, so she's a new researcher that they hired in this new invigoration of Capelin science. Uh, she's a young researcher who did her PhD in, uh, in Australia. Um, so anyway, uh, she spoke about that at her lecture and she discussed that Historically, in Newfoundland, um, they used to be able to time the spawning of Capelin with the end of the school year, so in June. Oh, okay. Um, and now uh, we're seeing them spawn later and later in the year. Like we're starting to see them in like late July. Like they're still spawning. I'm sure they spawned yesterday in Holyrood, right? Like it's August. And she's not sure. She's exploring this, but she thinks part there might be something to that and there might be a disconnect between um, the plankton blooms and when the capelin are spawning that might be happening. They may be um, having implications on the stock abundance. Okay. Yeah. So um, th you can't pick it, uh, but uh, we actually have a website uh, WWF Canada launched in 2016. It's called ecapelin.ca. And so it expands um, from Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador. And so when people see Capelin uh, spawning on the beach, they actually take a picture and they upload it to our website. And we have that geo. We put that up right away. So if you're planning on coming to Newfoundland or you're interested in when Capelin are spawning, you can go on ecapelin.ca and find out. And you can basically track them. So, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to pick your... Um, your vacation around when Cape Winter is morning, but I'd say if you go on vacation in July in Newfoundland, you want to see this phenomena occurring, definitely pick it in July. That's safer. And definitely check out ecapelin.ca to see where the activity has been. Yeah. yeah. How long do they, um, like once they start spawning on a particular beach, how long will that activity last for? Well, that also was discussed the other day, um, at that lecture with Hannah Murphy. Um, it used to be that all the capelin came to shore sort of at one time. Uh, that's, you know, what sort of the records were from, you know, people talking anecdotally about how it used to happen. And DFO, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, talked about how they used to observe this. But now we're seeing it happening in dribs and drabs. So I'm monitoring this one beach in Placentia Bay and uh, capelin spawned there a little bit in June. And a few times in July, um, usually it's the kind of thing that if you hear about it, 
you want to get there within a day or two, you know, because um, they're going to spawn out and they're going to die. Um, but what's been happening lately is we've been seeing them come back a couple of times. So, yeah, a few days usually. So I know we were going to record this the other day, but then mm -hmm. you were like, oh, I'm going to go to this meeting and yeah. like, I might find out some new information about um, whether the stock was doing better or worse than predicted. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the, the outcome on that? So uh, the reason I wanted to delay uh, was because uh, this year at the stock assessment that uh, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada did, um, they had concluded that the stock was in pretty poor conditions. It had it was down 70% from what uh, had been observed in the last few years. And as I mentioned before, if conditions are right, capelin are a boom bust species. So like um, they can recover quite quickly. Um, but we haven't seen that for a long time. Um, so I thought based on all of the rolling activity that we'd seen, we might have some updates. But when I went to the meeting, I realized and I saw the presentation that what we're seeing anecdotally, like across Newfoundland, we're seeing like we're seeing lots of rolling happening. Ultimately, it has no implications on um, whether cable are doing better or not. We still have to wait for the normal assessment process. So we still have no way of knowing right now if Cape Leonard are doing better or worse. And we won't know until March when all the data comes in because they're still, the Fisheries and Oceans Canada people are still collecting their data to make those, um, make those um, uh, analyses and, and make those conclusions. So I just thought maybe I might get a, a bit of a mid-season update. But yeah. no, they're still in the middle of all of their, uh, of their field work. So I didn't get much of an update. How is that, like, how do they even conduct that research where they determine whether or not, like, does someone go out and count them? Like, <laughs> Yeah, oh my God, this is so crazy. I mean, uh, uh, so what they do is, and you know... Uh, One, two, <laughs> three. Kind of. Um, so they use hydroacoustics, so they basically go out in vessels and use sonar okay. to see uh, Capelin schools, and then periodically they... Uh, will cast a net into that to verify that what they're seeing on the sonar is capelin. Yeah. And they do that all across sort of the northeast coast of Newfoundland. That's one way. And then another way that they uh, monitor them is they they monitor the emergence of larvae from an indicator beach. So they go to this one beach every year and they look at how many larvae are emerging and then they extrapolate how that is for the rest of the island. Okay. Um, and then um, they look at other oceanographic parameters, like what the temperature was, um, how many capelin were around one or two years ago. Yeah. And they use that information to figure out um, what they think the, uh, what they call uh, the biomass index is. So that's like basically... It's not an overall count, like they don't know exactly how many are around, but they do know if it's more or less than last year. Okay. So they can, it's an, it's an index in the sense that they can still use it to make decisions, like we can take more or we can take less, but it's not like they know exactly how many fish are out there. Yeah. This little pup is wild. I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> She's not used to being ignored. <laughs> Hang on, I got puppy treats here. Might need to take a break and uh, sprinkle some puppy treats. Yes, give her some puppy treats. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, eat them all. <laughs> She's like, I don't want them. It's so funny how um, she like, with any like full grown dog, when you throw something or you, you, you yeah. know, you point almost like they know they sense the direction. Like, <laughs> Is she just completely oblivious to, <laughs> yeah. to any noises or like? No, yeah, it's true. I just, <laughs> She's everything's new to her. She's yeah. Just a oh yeah, you can't blame her. She was wasn't alive <laughs> three months ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so counting fish is like, um, it's a pretty interesting and um multifaceted phenomena it's particularly difficult for capelin because they are pelagic they're up in the pelagic means they're up in the middle part 
of the water. And for fish that are on the bottom, like cod, they're a little bit easier to quantify because we can go out and just ultimately fish them at distinct at like all these different locations. Oh, okay. We can go out and be like what we call a, have a random stratified survey. So we send out boats and we take a sample of them at all these different locations. And then we come back and we say, okay, we, based on our statistical analysis, we think there's this many caught out there and it makes sense. But because Capelin don't actually stick to the bottom like that, um, that's why we need to use sonar. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, just before we keep going, I'm going to uh, pause this for a second. Yeah. Alrighty, we're back after a brief uh, puppy uh, drink refill. <laughs> the pee. <laughs> um, so, like conservation efforts, like what does that look like? What's being done, or that could be done? Um, yeah. So, um, the problem with sort of conservation efforts with uh, Capelin is that people assume because they're a boom bust species like hey we don't need to do anything like the ecosystem is going to just regenerate more capelin and you know there'll be good capelin when there's good years and poor capelin when poor years but you know it's been 25 years and that system hasn't worked for us um so ultimately DFO has had to be precautionary this year in the face of massive declines. They had to cut the quotas for Capelin by 35%, which um, Capelin is actually valued at about $6 million for uh, the province here. And it's, uh, it's only really a lucrative fishery here in Newfoundland. Like it's not lucrative in the other maritime provinces. So uh, it's got a massive, um, uh, it's got a massive uh, impact to, on local people. But ultimately, um, the reason that it's so important that we do cut quotas when we see signs are bad is because um, because Capelin can go through these massive declines really quickly in poor years, and we have to be really, really cautious to not take a lot in those years because if there's not enough capelin there to reproduce, we can't have those boom conditions, right? Um, so WWF Canada, which is the organization that I work for, has really been advocating for a sort of better left in the water approach. Um, the entire ecosystem relies on capelin for... Um, success and productivity and like for sustainable commercial fisheries of like other species in our province, like we need Capelin to be there. Um, so it's just practical that we leave these fish in the water at least um, enough there that they can sustain these other populations. So if we have enough Capelin around that we can harvest them um, and we can take a little bit of for ourselves and we can make a bit, uh, financially for the province, that's great. But if they're not doing well, we really need to leave them alone because um, they're just so important for the success of the whole ecosystem. Um, not to get like super political or anything, mm -hmm. but what are some objections to better left in the water? Well, um, it's a case of, I think... Um, it's it's a difficult decision to make. Um, it's um, conditions of scarcity, right? Like um, we would all like to live in a world where all the fish species were abundant and we all had enough to, you know, be uh, to sustain our way of life, to sustain um, a live, living income, and then something happens and all of a sudden. We don't, right? And so particularly in Newfoundland in the last 20, 25 years, uh, we've been seeing that for like a multitude of species. And right now I think we're at an extreme where we're seeing a lot of species that are in decline. And so when conditions are scarce, um, people, they don't have as much as they want. They don't have as much as they need to make a living and they don't have as much, they don't have enough 
of this resource to sustain their way of life. And so I think, yeah, there's a little bit of backlash or concern about that because um, it's so important. It's such an important component of people's incomes, right? A lot of people in Newfoundland rely on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy because I could see I can see both sides of the argument, right? Mm-hmm. There's this, the ethical like like conservation side where you're like, oh, we need to preserve the species for the betterment of the entire ocean, but at the same time, uh, I need food on my table, and like you know, I've, this has been my way of life for generations, right? Yeah. So I guess my way of thinking about that is like, if we have a diversified fishery where people are um, harvesting a multitude of species, then they're less reliant on one. And then um, they can um, harvest capable when conditions are good and harvest something else when conditions are bad. And um, in like Iceland and Norway and other places, um, if capable conditions are not good, they cut the fishery. Um, right away and and that's what we need to do here um, for sustainable long-term fisheries are there like successful models in other countries of um, conservation and and things like that yeah i mean uh, it's certainly not something that is my expertise like i'm more of a sort of marine biologist i i'm kind of focused on this um this ecosystem in general but i have definitely heard of of uh a more ecosystem based approach being applied. So uh, one of the issues with Canada and the way that we manage our fisheries historically is that we look at them as single, like we manage them as single species. How many cod are there? How many cod can we take? How many crab are there? How many crab can we take? How many capelin are there? How many capelin can we take? But if you integrate an ecosystem based approach, um, and you're looking at all of the factors, including temperature, uh, food availability, cons- uh, predation, um, and you take all of those into account, um, and then you manage capelin for not just how many capelin can you take, but what does that mean for cod, what does that mean for salmon, what does that mean for others, and you manage them all together um, in that ecosystem-based approach um, then it means more productive and sustainable fisheries overall. And I think that's what globally we're trying to get to. Uh, Maybe Canada's a little bit behind. There might be some, there might be some examples uh, worldwide, but um, I'm just not really well versed enough in the literature to really cite them. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, So like worst case scenario, uh, Mm -hmm. say if Capelin were to just completely vanish from the ocean overnight, uh, like what would be the chain reaction of events? Okay. Um, so, wow. Um, it, it would be a catastrophe. You were seeing it a little bit, like just in the last year, uh, from this massive reduction, but that was only, you know, in one year, right? So like we saw less capelin this year and we saw cod stocks were down. I'm sure you're hearing the new salmon aren't doing super well. Um, there's a lot of other species. So all of the species that depend on capelin would um, need to switch to less valuable food. So cod, for example, would have to be more reliant on shrimp and crab, which are harder to digest and like just not as nutritious. So you would see declines in them. Um, seabirds, uh, they would have to, like gannets and all of these other um Alcids and sorry, yeah, MERS, all these other species um, that are kind of such a key part of Newfoundland tourism, you would start to see them foraging further and further away from um, where their nest sites are, and uh, we already do see that when capelin conditions are bad, they they have to fly further and further and further, and that results in um, you know declines and deaths for them. Uh, but if there was none, uh, they would have to start to rely on alternative prey, and I think we would ha- we would have we would see massive ecosystem shifts, and uh, it would probably take you know decades to mm. recover from them. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about like that 
that chain reaction. And yeah, yeah. It just goes right down on the line. Like you, like you said, like it's a full ecosystem. You can't really just look at one aspect of it. Yeah, you would hope that like some other species would just fill the gap. Yeah. Like sand lance. We have another species that does sort of this stuff, sand lance. They would just come in and, you know, fill that ecological niche. But uh, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. I mean, and uh, we don't have any evidence that that would necessarily happen. How many bones are in a capelin? Oh, God, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I've eaten capelin a fair bit. I guess their bones are soft enough that it doesn't matter. Why are their bones soft like that? Like, why aren't they? Well, I guess fish typically have more flexible, like, how, I mean, what, like what's, a, what's a capelin bone look like compared to a human bone? Uh, I mean, I don't know. That's an aspect of their biology I don't often think about. But I guess if you've got to kind of undulate back and forth... Um, you've got to have, uh, like, a. I guess their bones are just a little bit thinner, a little bit more elastic, um, in order for them to just like move so fluidly through that liquid medium. Yeah. Are they like, what's a lifespan of one? <sighs> this is tricky as well. Um, so they used to live, they used to spawn and live, I think five, six years old, oh, but wow. now they're, they're like reproducing at age two. Yeah. Which is bad. Um, we don't necessarily know why, and there's a couple of researchers that are looking at that. Uh, but when they reproduce younger, that means they're actually smaller when they're reproducing. And as I mentioned before, they die, right? So that means they're dying at age two and not at age five, so they're not around. But that doesn't give them as much time to grow and to produce eggs and and so um, the capelin that are reproducing are smaller and they can, I think that has implications on the overall recruitment. And what we, when we say the word recruitment, that means how many new recruits or new individuals enter the population each year when they okay. reproduce. Um, so when they're spawning at smaller ages and dying at smaller ages, uh, that's not necessarily a good thing. And I think it might be a sign of stress. Okay. Yeah. Um. That must just be like some instinctive pressure or stress from the environment, right? Not like a, a capelin's worried about its bills or something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, like I said, nobody's um, actually got any conclusive research on that. But um, one explanation is that uh, f that we've seen in some other species is that there's something uh, something occurring called contemporary evolution. So when larger fish are being taken out of the ecosystem through fishing that maybe are being marketed, um, they start to reproduce smaller. It's the same as like if you were mowing your lawn and all of a sudden the dandelions were blooming below the, the shear of your blade. It's an evolutionary response that says, hey, if I get big, I'm going to get chopped down. But if okay. I say small... Um, and I reproduce then, then I get a chance at least. Yeah. So um, if they wait till age five to reproduce, maybe they're going to get captured by the fishery, but maybe strategically it might make sense to reproduce at age two. Like I said, there hasn't been research on that for capelin, but that has been the case for other species. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said for most of like the 90s, the stock has been declining. Mm -hmm. Did people develop the mentality of, boom or bust because that's the way it actually was or like is there much data prior to the 90s on the whole situation or oh well um it's it's been pretty well documented not just for, for capelin but for a lot of other sort of pelagic forage fish um and i think um Pelagic, yeah, I don't know pelagic, what you said? pelagic. Yeah, that's that midwater oh, sort okay, of fish. Yeah, yeah. But thinking, uh, I don't know when they kind of figured out the capelin or boom bust, but it's definitely the case for like a lot of similar species. So I think it's it's pretty substantiated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So last night, what was like, uh, or was the last night you had that two meeting? nights ago? Two nights ago. Mm -hmm. What was kind of like the vibe in the room? on like Caitlin and like was it optimistic or pessimistic or uh I think it was um right now it's sort of the middle of the year um 
in like the March part of the year, like the, um, like when the assessment comes out, there's a lot of opinions that get hashed out before decisions are made for the fisheries. So like before um, the decision was made by DFO to cut 35% of the fishery of the quota or the total allowable catch, there was a lot of opinions being raised. But at this point in the season, um, people have already landed their capelin or are, you know, in the process of doing so. So people aren't at the point, aren't right now advocating for anything. They're just waiting. Um, so it was curiosity was the vibe in the room, I think. Uh, that was the vibe that I kind of explained to you before I went to listen to Hannah Murphy's talk. It was like, you know, does do we have any, you know, sneak peeks? of what to expect for next year's assessment. Yeah. And, uh, um, and that, that was generally, I think the vibe of the room was, you know, not so much, Hey, we're advocating for one thing or the other, but Hey, what, what's, what does the science say now? Yeah. Um, and because it's too early to tell because DFO is still collecting a lot of this information, um, their acoustic surveys done, but it hasn't been analyzed. Uh, their larval uh, estimate hasn't been done. Um, they basically don't have any major updates for us. So the that vibe was a little bit neutral. And I think you'll see that change as we get um, towards the next stock assessment. Okay. Yeah. Um, just there's a question I want to ask about the quota mm -hmm. stuff. So obviously there's like a fishery based around Capelin. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but primarily my experience and my thoughts when I think Capelin are people down on the beach in the rubber boots, yeah. five gallon buckets and all that. Like you don't need a license or anything to go and do that. Like no. why like that must have a minor impact. Like all those people in communities all over the Island just going and. Yeah. So um, somebody tried to bait me with this on the CBC uh, earlier um, a couple of months ago and I was taken off guard with the question. I didn't, answer it thoroughly i said nah there's no impact to that um but i mean nobody's quantifying it right like nobody's going out and figuring out what you and i are doing when we go and take cable off the beach um here's what i do know okay so those eggs that are on the beach when they do spawn are pretty tough right so you know i don't really think that trampling them with your feet is going to have a major impact i think maybe driving AT atvs and stuff on the beach would be another story but i think going out to the beach i don't know but i, I think it's probably all right what i would say is that i think personally this is my personal opinion not the opinion of wwf canada i think people sometimes take more capable than they need to when they go to the beach like um you don't need your five gallon bucket if you're going to put it in the freezer and not eat it and it's going to get freezer burnt or yeah. whatnot. Like, why don't you go out, enjoy the phenomenon, have fun, catch them, allow them to spawn, right? Like let them finish doing what they're doing and take enough to have a feed or a boil up and take enough that you're going to use, but just be sure that you don't get kind of caught up in the fun of catching the capelin so much that you take more than you need to, because I think that's, it's just a really fun thing to do and sometimes people can get overwhelmed with it and yeah. want to get as much as they can, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll let you have a sip of wine. Sure. <laughs> champagne, rather. Mm -hmm. um, I just got married last month, so I have a lot of champagne Oh, left that's over. always nice. Yeah, yeah, that abundance of <laughs> boozy gifts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm the average Joe. Like, mm -hmm. why should I care about Caitlin and what's happening to them? Well, you like eating fresh seafood, right? I sure do. <laughs> right? Okay. So, cool. So, uh, like, you should care about capelin for, um, you know, the fact it, that you're not going to get a really, um, you're not going to get really good quality cod and other fish if capelin aren't there for them to feed on. They make the best food for them. Uh, and ecotourism. Um, this rolling phenomenon is something really unique to the island and um if there's not capel in there to do it i mean that's that's pretty it's pretty sad so uh, you should care about it for that and uh, ultimately um our oceans are hugely important to our climate to our atmosphere to the production of 
um, the air that we breathe, um, to healthy, safe food. Um, ultimately, yeah, we should care about Capelin because we're still a part of that coastal ecosystem. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. That's pretty good. You actually offered like a couple angles there that I hadn't considered, especially mm-hmm. like, yeah, I love seafood. Who doesn't? Mm-hmm. Especially if you're in Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. But the ecotourism as well, right? It all like kind of, it all trickles down, right? Yeah. I mean, Newfoundland, got, I'm not going to take a dig at Newfoundland because Newfoundland has so much ecotourism and, but like July month, man, what a great month. Oh, that's another thing. You know, those whales, those all those whale tours that you see in these, um, uh, the humpbacks that we're seeing breaching, they wouldn't be there if they weren't here to feed on capelin. Yeah. So it's not just the capelin rolling, but it's all the things, the seabirds and the, the whales and stuff that are here to, to feed on them. Yeah. 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 So you got to think about them. Support the capelin homies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally. Um, so just like wrapping up here, if people want to learn more about capelin, uh, where would you send them? Um, I would check out WWF Canada's Food for All report, um, which has um, some information about Capelin, but also has uh, information of others about other species that fill similar roles in other uh, parts of the world. Um, I would direct them to our eCapelin.ca website, uh, where they can see where Capelin have been rolling this year and last year and other years. Um, and I would. Uh, direct them to the DFO website where uh, they have a bunch of reports on Capelin, fact sheets for just, you know, um, the basic information that uh, we talked about today, but probably filling in even more gaps than we discussed. Um, yeah, I think that would be, there's a whole bunch of researchers at a Memorial University and, uh, and other universities that also do research on Capelin. So, um, I would check out the websites of Craig Purchase at Memorial University, Gail Daveron at University of Manitoba, Bill Monavecki at Memorial University, and probably a plethora of others, and uh, Hannah Murphy at DFO as well, and Fran Mowbray at DFO. They all contribute to our understanding of all the stuff that I talked about today. It's not my information. It's the information that these people have built in their life's work. Yeah. So I would check out um, DFO and and uh, those spots for sure. Right on. I'll uh, try to remember to put links to that stuff in like the description and stuff online. So oh yeah, I can totally provide that. Yeah, for you. don't uh, listener, don't have to worry about <laughs> <laughs> writing it down. Sorry about that. I had to name drop because I was uh, sharing so much information that I didn't actually research myself. Good on you. <laughs> um, thanks again for coming on and uh, telling me about the Cape one. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, it's been an awesome time. Right on. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. For any and all past episodes, be sure to search Curious Jord on your favorite podcasting app.